Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Great to see kids coming forth in the boldness to sing praises unto our God. Hallelujah. I was a youth pastor for about six years, worked for youth, maybe about ten, so very, make sure you appreciate your youth. Some churches don't have any, don't have any at all. So them to come boldly like that, we need to give praise unto God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, I'm not much of a singer, so you're going to have to help me with this song, all right? Most of you know this song. Kumbaya, my Lord, kumbaya. Kumbaya, my Lord, kumbaya. Kumbaya, my Lord, kumbaya. Oh, Lord, kumbaya. Thank you. You may be seated. You know, thinking about that song and how the slaves were being beaten, and they should say, Kumbaya, my Lord. As they were being raped, they kept on saying, Kumbaya, my Lord. As even the men were being raped, they kept on saying, Kumbaya, my Lord. Lynched and burned. They went through perilous, time, perilous times, but yet they kept on singing, Kumbaya, my Lord. Said, Come, arise. God said somebody is praying, somebody is crying, and they kept on singing Kumbaya. And it's amazing how now we're not even going through half of what they went through. And many of our churches grow empty. Many of people are walking away from God instead of coming to the one that gives us strength. It's just so amazing how much he loves us. Even through the times of trying to be eliminated, we still keep on going. We're still here today. Even through civil rights, sometimes they try to take our rights away. Even when they kill our children here recently by guns and shootings, we're still here. Hallelujah. I'm thankful to be here. I'm thankful for Pastor White, um, first as a friend. As he said, he does give me counsel, and I appreciate um, having a man of God um, still here that's not out for money or you know, corrupting or doing stuff. Um, that we know that's not godly, but he stands on the word, and I appreciate that. I appreciate that. It's good to have a good pastor. It's very good to have a good pastor. I'm also thankful for my wife and my daughter being here, um, for having um, patience with me, especially when I spend a lot of money trying to research stuff and um, not getting too mad at me. I'm thankful for her being with me as my mother and my aunt as well. They're always there by my side. You know, she said um, they, they knew I was my wife's husband when they first saw me. So that was a good sign. That was good with the family. I'm thankful for my um, Hebrew Heritage family coming to support. Appreciate y'all coming, always being there. I um, also thank you for some of the Solid Rock members being here. That, um, you know, even though um, we're no longer together um, physically, we're still together through the spirit. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Um, you know, I'm dressed like this. This is the first time I ever put this on. Just want to make sure y'all know I'm not, um, don't believe in Judaism. Just make sure that's clear. Make sure that's clear. I know some of y'all look a little nervous, but don't worry. Um, many times we actually have on our uh, African attire, but we don't realize that this is actually African attire. We don't realize that. And um, I don't know if we have the slides coming up. All right. So, you know, actually people don't know that there's black Jews in Africa. And it's very um, meaningful because, um, you know, actually they wrote a book about it. And this is actually a scholarly book, you know, that um, actually um, um, a, a, a European-American actually wrote that book, talking about the number of black Jews there are in Africa. Um, you know, many times we wear a certain attire, and we don't even know where it comes from, right? Um, there's many tribes and many people that's actually in Africa. Africa is a continent, not a country. I just want to make sure people know that. They always say you come from Africa. We're like, wait a minute, that's a whole continent that's there. It's not a country. You know, you got Congo, you got Ghana, you got a lot of different countries, and um, many of those don't even get along with each other. So, you know, even though um, America comes from a, a European background, we know that they come from the British, right? We know about Britain. So in the same way that we come from certain places in Africa, certain tribes of people, and um, we're going to go back, and based upon our Bible history, we're going to see how, you know, we're connected to that. 
You know, it's amazing when we don't even know in high schools and schools around, even colleges, they don't teach about anything but the slave ship. That's how far back they go, the slave ship. I don't even know if you heard about how here um, recently they were talking about having African American history in schools, but they, they, they denied it. I wonder why. Why, why would they deny something that's so important to us being oppressed and subjugated for so long? Why is that important? And we're going to talk about some of that today. And first of all, I'm just going to talk about my little outfit. So if we go to the first slide, we've got a lot of information that I'm going to go through real fast. I don't think you're going to be able to keep track of me in the Bible, so it might be best to write down the scripture so you can go back and reflect. And I also will leave the um, slides here so you can actually go back through it. Um, usually this is a um, three or three to four, I don't know, my family there, there was a, three to four hours, but I, I broke it down, it's going to be under an hour, so don't worry, don't worry, it's going to be under an hour. <laughs> it was hard, but I did it. Uh, so, you know, when we talk about, you know, the, the dress, even in the Bible, even in Africa, um, there's some thing called fringes that they actually wear, and um, it's actually part of scripture, so even when you see my shirt, And it's a very important part because it was actually in the Bible, and it says that um, in Numbers 15, 37 through 40, it talks about how put these fringes on the border of your garments. Why did they do that? And it also said put a ribbon of blue there. And you see this is a ancient pictures of the Israelites, and you can see that they have fringes there. But it says that it may be for um, a fringe that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord. So it's about as a remembering about his commandments that we need to keep, right? And that ye shall ye seek not after your own heart and your own desires. So it's very important um, memory to actually show people that we are part of God's, right? It's a memory of, of commandments. You know, some people wear dashikis. Y'all, how many people know where a dashiki come from? That's what I thought. <laughs> a lot of people don't know about the Yoruba and the house of traditions and some of the words that's there, but these those come from certain tribes. You know, I think it was popularized by some um, African Americans and it got popular. But a lot of people don't even know that it has meaning. You know, but we at least try to support our people, right? Try some kind of Africa, right? So <laughs> we're we getting there. Um, next slide. Um, so, what is the name of God? Do we know? We say God and we say Lord, but we, do we know actually the name of God? We say it, hint, we say it every Sunday. We say it every Sunday after Sunday. But if you look in your Bibles between, you know, those pages that you quickly flip over between the table of contents and Genesis, sometimes they have a description of the translation of the words and how they actually translate it. Because remember, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, and the New Testament was written in Greek or Latin, and they translate it to English. So when we read those um, couple of pages that we flip through real fast, it says, um, this is New King James. Um, the covenant name of God was usually translated from the Hebrew word as Lord or God, using capital letters as strong in the King James Old Testament. So they said basically they replaced the words with the words Lord or God. So when you go through your Bible and you see the cup, uppercase letters of Lord, that's a replacement word. You know, so take note of that. So we got to kind of wonder, like, okay, so God and Lord are titles. What is his name? We say it. Y'all know it. Y'all wave it. Yeah, y'all wave a translation to it, too. But it's very close to what I'm getting to, at least. But um, turn to the next slide, please. It's Yah. Yah. And it's so important that we understand the name from a heritage standpoint. It's very important, and we'll see. Because um, even if you open up your Bible in Psalm 68, 4, it says, Sing to God. Sing praises to his name, to his name. Extol him who rise on a cloud by his name, Yah, and rejoice before him. So it said, use his name to glorify him. It's very important that we use his name, Yah. Wait a minute. We said, hallelujah. Huh. So we use his name every week, week after week, to give him praise. And we don't even know what we're saying. <laughs> but we just praise him. We say, hey, that's the highest praise. Hallelujah. You know? Um, and there's some other scriptures. Um, actually a new King James. So if you go through your other Bibles, they might not have it in there. They're starting to take it out. Um, King James might say Jah. You know, some of the Rastafarians say, hey, Jah, you know, but there's no J actually in Hebrew. So the word is Yah. Yah. All right. Let's go to the next slide. So if we actually look up the name Yah, um, in, the, in the Bible concordance, you can look up the meaning of names. And you see there, um, 
um, under the strong concordance that it says the name of God of Israel is Yah. Right there in the top left hand corner, right? Um, and y'all need to slow down your pen. I don't know, we got a lot of slides, so, okay. <laughs> um, and then also, hallelujah means, halle means praise or shine. Praise or shine, yeah. So, hallelujah. Also, you know, we know Jesus is the Greek form of his name, but there's also a Hebrew form of his name, um, meaning Joshua. That means that he saves, you know, came to his name meant salvation. Very important that we know his name, you know, says he's come as Emmanuel, based upon salvation. So, um, the name Yahusha means salvation. Um, Judah is actually Yahuda, Yah, once again. Um, Y'all should said whom by Ma. How did the Africans know Hebrew? Thought about that? This is a slave song. How did the Africans know Hebrew? Hmm. So we actually look at the names of the um, Hebrew people, um, disciples and people in the Bible. You can actually see that, you know, we use the, in the anglicized name of some of these people like John, which is Yukonan, you know, Yah. You see Yah there. It means Yah has been gracious. Uh, we already talked about Joshua or Jehoshaphat is Yahusaphat. I'm not good with all the Hebrews, just so, so don't repeat some of the stuff I say. Just come close. I'm coming close. Uh, Yah has judged. Um, Obadiah is over Yahu, um, servant of God. Zephaniah is Zepha Yahu. You hear the Yah in the names? So it's very important because you can actually go into a slave voyage database that was put together by um, different um, um, education institutions, and they basically took the, the trade travel um, logs um, when they were selling the slaves, and they wrote down the slaves' names. And if it's very amazing that if you look through that database, which you can go with slaveorges.org, you just go on the internet and search it, it actually has Yah in the slaves' names. So B'nai Yah, you know, Yah has built. Um, Aya, a precious gift of Yah. Maya, um, which means close to Yah. Naya, Yah answers. Actually, the name Yah is a name, which actually means God. Actually, I met a lady from um, young lady from Ghana about two weeks ago at a birthday party. Her name was Yah as well. So these are names that um, especially the tribes in West Africa actually use, which refers to Yah. All right, let's go to the next slide. So, you know, we ever heard of ghetto names? Bon Krisha, um, Tanya. Uh, my sister's name is Keisha. You know, Latifa, Saniqua, all those. But what's common to those names? You hear Ah, or uh, A-H, or even a, a Y. Very interesting, right? And if you look up the word ghetto in the dictionary, it's a very interesting definition saying a quarter of a city in which Jews were formerly required to live. So why do they call our ghetto something requiring in reference to Jews? Interesting. Hmm. All right, let's go to another slide. And there are scriptures that says, when the Messiah came, she says, I am come in my father's name. Hmm. That's very interesting because his name means Yah saves. He came in his father's name. His father's name is Yah. He comes in his name. Yah saves, right? What about this scripture? If my people, which are called by my name, hmm, you know the word Israel, and um, there's different ways that people try to translate it, but one is Yashorel, and it actually means Prince God of God in Yah. You know, so it makes a big difference. So here's a prophecy scripture, right? It says in Isaiah, I will say to the north, give up, and to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth, even everyone that is called by my name. Hmm. Very interesting, right? And even we talked about Judah, you know, there was a lion of Judah. Who's that? The Messiah. Y'all turn around. What's that right there? Lion of Judah, right? Big flags. I know I came here. I was like, whoa, that's wow. That's amazing. <laughs> you know, I came here a couple of weeks, well, a couple of months back, but I was like, oh, I like that. <laughs> All right, next slide. And um, a lot of people don't know about, everybody heard of the Gullah people? Anybody? Gullah people? Um, there was an old show, Nick Leonian, called Gullah Gullah Island. 
And I didn't know that was our people. I didn't have a glass. Of, I was just happy to see our people on the TV show uh, with a frog jumping around. Um, but the word Gullah is actually a Hebrew word. It actually means bold. So the people there was mixed together, so it's kind of like a mixture, like somebody's mixing a bowl of, of different cultures of um, people that's from Ashanti, that was Ghana, um, people from Nigeria that was taken over as slaves. They started their own language and their own culture. Um, and then they actually are the ones that came up with the song Kumbaya. That's credit to them. And um, it's very important because um, um, a lot of people don't know um, if your ancestry comes anywhere from Jacksonville, North Carolina, down to Jacksonville, Florida, the slaves that came on ship were part of your family, you are a Gullah person. A lot of people don't know that. It says 85% of African Americans are Gullah people. Some call them Gullah Geechee, but, you know, I went down there to the tour. They told me that's more of a derogatory for word, for word, so I don't know what Geechee means, but I'm not going to continue to say it. But Gullah, the Gullah people. And actually, man, I didn't really was part of the presentation, but the guy right there, he actually was a slave, and when he got off the boat, only thing he could speak was Hebrew and Arabic. He actually became a Hebrew scholar down in Charleston, I think, area. So it's very important that we understand our history, because, you know, actually there's property and stuff you can actually get and prove it, but um, they actually taken away that land and turned it into um, a beach resort, and still in that land, and that's the oldest connection to our African heritage that we have in America. So it's very important if you take a trip down there, at least to Savannah, Georgia, or to Charleston, they'll take you through a tour. But um, it's good to learn about our history. All right, next slide is basically a um, association called the International Study of the for the Stu International Society for the Study of African Jewry. So they actually know about all these different African tribes in um, um, in Africa, and they meet together, people from different religions and races. They come together. I think it's like once or twice a year and talk about the people that's in Africa that are Jews. And it's very interesting because if you start looking at some of the places, you know, keep in mind, kind of keep an idea of where those places are that they're actually noting. A lot of them on the West Coast, some of them on the East Coast. Um, but if we turn to the next slide, you can see this is my DNA map at the bottom. Now I compare that with the map from, and look at where all the connections are. We have a lot of overlap there, right? And you have basically the same DNA, all very close. So most African Americans are connected. Um, so most of your um, DNA is the same. As you see, it's all a lot of the West African countries that my DNA is connected to um, because there was a mixture of those African tribes, right? So you probably have a good dose of all these different African tribes that's out there. Um, but there are also the Cambridge University Press. Cambridge University is one of the leading world researchers of information. And this is what they say. Um, Dr. Alan H. Godby, which is a Duke University professor back in the 1900s. He's an Old Testament um, philosopher. And he says he reached the following conclusions. These factors have a very specific significance if we consider the presence of Jude Judaism among the American Negroes. Hundreds of thousands of slaves were transported to America from West Africa during the trade, which started some 400 years ago, which traces of Judaism still remained among the Negroes of West Africa at that period. To the extent that they were persecuted, they were more likely than other Negroes to be seized during the wars and sold as slaves. It is, a virtually, it is virtually certain that many part Jewish Negroes were among those sent as slaves to, and then it's the part that says America. So a lot of those Jewish um, slaves were some of your ancestors. All right, let's go to the next one. Ghana. I'm going to talk about just two of the tribes. There's a lot of tribes that I can talk about that's connected, but two of the main tribes, um, one is Ghana. So in Ghana, they're actually called the Ashanti people, and I see... Um, I think Deacon um, wearing the nice little colorful cloth. That's a, a kente cloth from um, the Ashanti people. That's a symbol of them. And um, the Ashanti actually means son. T means son. So son of Ashan. That's what it actually means. And actually the word Ashan is in the Bible. Very interesting. So it's actually one of the villages that the um, sons of Simeon actually went and um, lived in. So they actually know. I actually have, uh, I was going to bring them, but one of my Ashanti friends, he knows that they're connected to the ancient Israelite people. He knows. You can actually buy books about the um, Ashanti people and some of their cultures of circumcision and even how I think it's them who actually 
put mud on the doors, just like, you know, when, when the Israelites had to put blood on the door, they still do some of those same things even to this day. So when the Europeans actually came there to see them, they found this guy, this priest here. And the priest actually had the breastplate of Israel on his chest when they got there. Interesting. What? How did he get a breastplate of Israel that's mentioned in the Bible but by the priest on his chest? They had the 12 stones. And it goes even farther because the hat he had on, it actually had the names of YHWH, so Yahweh, Yahuwah, Yah. He had it on his hat. Interesting. Very interesting. All right. A lot of people don't know that the next slide is the African Baptist Church. Everybody been to African Baptist Church down in Savannah, Georgia? That's the oldest slave church in America. The oldest slave church in America. And it's very interesting when I went on the tour because I wanted to make sure. I actually, when I went down this line, I was trying to disprove it. I was actually trying to disprove it. But um, after I saw so many facts, I was like, whoa, wait a minute. It's kind of hard. How many facts do you need before you actually believe something? So um, the altar there, where the pulpit, they actually made is made out of gopher wood, just like the Ark of the Covenant that was made. The windows is actually, they put veils on it, just like in the temple that they open and close the veil. And then on the side of the pews, they said it was a type of cursive Hebrew that the slaves were writing that's mixed with Arabic. So how did the slaves know how to write Hebrew? Why would they take on these customs and these different traditions? And actually, if you see the church, um, they do tours. You know, the, the assistant pastor gave me the tour, and he was very unapologetic about the people being Hebrews. He said that he didn't care if scholars came in or what. He said, yeah, we are of the Hebrew people. And I was like, whoa, you know. So the red doors is actually a sign of the Igbo people. And the Igbo people actually are in Nigeria. And they put a red door to show people that the debt has been paid. They've been cleared. So they actually have the red door there to show that their debt has been paid, and they build these churches. Um, and it goes even into more history, but I'm trying to hold to my time. I'm trying to hold down. So, um, um, and then um, if we go to the next slide, the Igbo people in Nigeria, right? So this is Henry Kissinger. Anybody knows him? He won a Nobel Peace Prize. He actually was one of the um, people that left from the Holocaust to America um, and actually became the um, Secretary of State for Nixon and um, Gerald Ford. And he had, during the war in Nigeria, there was a war with the Igbo people um, called the Biafra War. And um, his report to the White House says this, the Igbos are the wandering Jews of West Africa. It says that in his report to the White House. So this is an official document that you can go up there and Google, you know, find it yourself. Um, don't believe me. I, I didn't believe people telling me, so don't believe me. Go look up the stuff yourself. And um, you will see there, so he is a Jewish person saying that West Africans are Jews. Interesting. We go to the next slide, we start talking about Nigeria, and there's the Igbo people. They're all over the news. They have books about them, talking about being from the tribe of Gad. Actually, the Jewish people went down there, and they actually said, yes, these are Jewish people. Um, CNN did a report on them. There's books actually written by the Igbos um, saying that at least 25% of African Americans descend from them. I have seen reports um, from Virginia that says at least 65% of African Americans at least have one um, Igbo ancestor. 65% of them, especially from Virginia area, because in Virginia, 85% of the slaves were taken were um, Igbo. 85%. So if you have um, any kind of ancestry in Virginia, there's a good chance that you're um, Igbo. And um, during the time, they said, were very, they said that those slaves were very rebellious. You know, they didn't play around. You know, maybe that's where we got some of my attitudes from, right? Um, stubborn and stiff-necked people, as the Bible calls them. <laughs> um, so um, during that time, you know, um, in Virginia, if we go to the next slide, we can kind of have some association to that, right? Because we have Nat Turner. Nat Turner was in Virginia, right? Slave, big slave rebellion. Even in some of the articles that you see on the top right, it actually says that, you know, people had an ad in the paper about runaway Igbo, see, Igbo, Igbo, all the same, same thing. Um, Igbo Negro, they call the slaves Igbo. They actually recognize them as being Igbo. Um, if you look on the top left, um, there's a marker, a U.S. marker in a place called Farmville, Virginia. And um, I don't know if you heard of Longwood um, University, it's around that area, and I actually went and go visit it and make sure it was real myself. And it talks about, it says um, about Thomas Jefferson had a cousin named, um, what's his name, Richard Randolph. 
And he basically wanted to show people that the slaves can be free and they kind of live outside. So when he died, he gave them land and freedom. And the first thing they did was go build a place called Israel Hill. That's the place that the slaves called it. And they called themselves Israelites. So on the U.S. market, it says these Israelites, remember this is a U.S. federal marker, these Israelites and other free African Americans worked as farmers, craftspeople, and so forth. And it says that, you know, they actually sued people during slavery and was winning. You know, there's a big book. This is one of the best um, publishing books. Um, and it talks about Israel Hill. And, you know, it's a big author, you know, um, and you can find it online. But um, if you actually, so when I found about Igbo, I said, let me go find out where some other places are. So right here in North Carolina, I was actually heard about some um, a Jewish community. So I said, they were supposed to be old since the 1800s. So let me go visit and see what it's all about. They were closed. And I went down to Southern Pines and came to find out this woman took me. She said, yo, I know, um, you know, a black community in this area. So she took me to a place called Taylortown. Anybody been to Taylortown? Taylortown was started by an Igbo slave that was given freedom. His name was Dem Demos um, Taylor. So they say on the website, if you go to it, it says he was an Igbo slave. So right here in North Carolina, we had some Igbo people as well. And then in um, Georgia, um, right around where the slave church was, um, the slave church that was given freedom, there's a place called Igbo Landing and where the boats was coming in with slaves and the slaves jumped and killed themselves because um, they didn't want to be slaves. They knew where they were coming from, and they, they killed themselves. So the place is called Igbo Landing, um, right down there in the Georgia area. And it's part of Gullah culture, so it's part of our culture as well. So there's a lot of rich history that's out there. And even my DNA test talks about me being 22.2% Nigerian. I always kind of question the percentages. But um, I do have um, ancestors um, that have passed down their story throughout our family that talks about how they left this place called Anambra and, um, you know, how they drugged them and made them sleepy. And as they took them the long ways to put them on slave ships. And um, in Anambra, 98% of the people from there are Igbo. So it just shows you that we have a, many of you are Igbo as well. Rather, you go take a test, you'll see it. <laughs> um, and it just shows you how we're connected to the same culture that Henry Kissinger said, these are the wandering Jews of West Africa. And to give you even more evidence, Please go to the next slide. There are Igbos in there having messages to African Americans. And this is what they say. Actually, the throne you sit on on the floor, there's one of the oldest forms of Hebrew called Paleo-Hebrew that was written on the floor way back, way back, ancient Hebrew. Before, you know, you see the little Hebrew with the little dots and stuff, it's before that Hebrew, even further back than that. And he says, we are Igbos in Algeri village of Om Omoberi tribe. We are waiting a long time for the arrival of the Israelites. He's talking to us. He says, we, the Igbo, have been waiting for you, and we have connections with you for ages. So they know who we are. They know who they are. So, you know, this actually is a waking up to our culture because, like I said, they don't want you to know anything else except you came off of slave ships. All right, and next slide is actually talking about the 400 year of return in Ghana. So in Ghana, how many of y'all know last year was 400 years of slavery was completed, commencement? Anybody? Okay. You know, people all around the world were celebrating us, and our people didn't even know about it. Actually, there was a bill that um, Trump gave called H.R. 1242 that he actually made it law that the commencement had to be celebrated, and we didn't even know about it. Money was given out to the Smithsonian and many places, and we didn't even partake of it. People all around, I think New York Times has a big article about the 400 year of slavery, and we didn't even know. Why is all this being so secretive about us? Um, and actually in Ghana, they're actually saying, we want you to come back. They're actually giving you land. They're giving you dual citizenship that you can still partake of right now. Um, they're actually sending money out to the diaspora, to America, billions of dollars for people to start business because they want their people back. And they're not the only people. I think um, Senegal and I um, um, can't think of the other place. Um, what's that? Was it Gambia? I can't think of the other place off the top of my head. But they also are doing it. It's called, the, you know how they had the door of no return? They're calling it the door of return. And a lot of people like Steve Harvey and what's that rapper, Ludacris or something, they actually want to do that and starting to get their dual citizenship so they can actually do business. And it's very interesting because there's a scripture that talks about the 400 years that Abraham says. He said, after 400 years, my people will return with great wealth. Mm, very interesting. All right, the next slide talks about the Negro slave map. So anybody ever heard of Negro land? 
that's the place they got the Negroes from, the slaves, right? Negro land. That was actually a place marked in West Africa called Negro land. I was amazed. I was like, I didn't know why they call us Negro. But that's the reason why, because Negro in Portuguese means black. Black. And it gets even deeper, but I won't have time to go in there. We're actually talking about the Portuguese and how there was black Portuguese already there. And I don't know if you ever heard about the Moors who conquered Spain and ruled it for 700 years, bringing a rich culture of knowledge and architect to Europe. Dark Ages, maybe there's a reason they call it dark, right? Because these are black people born in Europe, carrying the stuff. But anyway, um, in Negro land, there's actually a place to call the Slave Coast. I know they teach Slave Coast in school. Slave Coast, the Tooth Coast, the um, Gold Coast, and so forth. So on the Slave Coast, you actually can see a place that actually says Kingdom of Judah. So Judah, that's Judah right there, right? Line of Judah. So why would they say that this is in Nigeria? And these are the Portuguese, the enslavers, calling this place Judah. Hmm. Y'all still with me, right? I ain't losing nobody. All right. Um, in the next slides, actually, um, there were some Europeans that actually went to um, Africa, and they wrote this, one of them wrote this book, um, Hebrewism of West Africa. I think that's a, a European. But anyway, um, it was published in 1931. And they actually talked about, in the book, talks about how these certain culture of Ashanti or Yoruba, um, how they migrated from Jerusalem. Hmm. How they migrate from Jerusalem? Ain't that the Bible? Jerusalem? They migrated to West Africa from Jerusalem? When was that taught in Black History or Black History Month or taught in schools? Hmm. And actually, um, next slide is actually talking about Kojic. People ever heard of Kojic? Actually, there was a, the founder of Tro Kojic was Charles Manson. Charles Manson actually was taught under a guy named William Christian. William Christian used to teach in America um, back in the 1890s, I believe, that uh, we were the people. We were the Israelites and part of the church services. And William Christian, the beginning of Kojic, actually was trained under that for four or five years before he started the Kojic church. So what happened to this knowledge? What happened to this information that we don't know about it now? You know, I actually put an article about this. I put stuff on Facebook about this all the time. And, uh, man, that's about 8,000 people. I was like, I was getting scared. I was like, I didn't mean for it to go that big. But <laughs> they were like, oh, I knew it. Yeah. And I was like, one woman said that um, she was a Jew, her, her parents was Jew and helped him start the church. And I was like, whoa, what in the world is going on? So it was very informative, even for me. But when we actually go to the next slide, you'll see that the Cambridge University Press, once again, talks about, it says, from 1900s, onwards, North and South Carolina were overrun by black preachers who was propagating a doctrine according to the lost tribe of the house of Israel was none other than the Negroes. Although this might be first, at first sight seem an odd claim, it can be in reflecting that the, the belief that some black slaves had held during their captivity when they were interrogated on their origins and their destiny. So this is a world-winning paper talking about this. And then, even here in North Carolina, I found a guy named Richard A. Morris from Clinton, North Carolina, and he went to Livingston College, and it talks about how he actually was a preacher at um, First Baptist Church of Plymouth, North Carolina. And um, you can get his book on lines like 99 Cent, and he talks about the connection of, of black people to the line of the Messiah and the people of the Bible. He talks about it right there in his book, and he's from, what, 1892? So there's actually a lot of information. If we go to the next slide, this is actually a, um, a, a white scholar. His name is Arthur Tal Talmadge Opernethy, and he actually was here from North Carolina, from Roosevelt College, North Carolina. I don't know where that's at, but anybody else? Roosevelt College, North Carolina? I don't know where that's at. But um, he actually was, went to Trinity College, which ended up becoming Duke University. And he was a scholar. He had a doctorate degree from John Hopkins University, and he had wrote the book, the Jew a Negro, talking about how Jews and Negroes have the same ancestry. And if we look at the picture of an Israelite, if we go to the next slide, it's very interesting because the Israelites wouldn't draw pictures of themselves because they could not gra grave in images, but their enemies drew pictures of them. And that's a brother with a fro and a beard. I mean, it's kinky hair. Come on. I mean, I don't, even that in the bottom, we got dreadlocks. Dread dreadlocks. So if you even take your phone, whenever, don't, don't trust me. Like I said, take your phone, put ancient Israelite, of, of, of ancient Israelite pictures. You'll see some of these pictures. And it's like it's no denying it. 
that the, that the people of the um, Bible were black. And if we go to the next one, we actually see um, some other archaeology. The one on the left is actually in, in London, and it came from Egypt. But it said that during the time of the Messiah, that that's what the Jews looked like, the Hebrew people looked like. And on the right, that's a picture of the slaves that were in Egypt. That's actually is coming from um, a museum in Israel. So that's what the ancient slaves looked like of the Bible. When you start talking about how they were, you know, living in um, with Pharaoh and the curses and all that stuff that was plagues and stuff that was happening, that's what they looked like. So that's very interesting because we know who went to Egypt as a slave? Joseph, right? So let's talk about Joseph. Let's go to the next slide. Um, and somebody keep me on some time because I can keep talking. I don't know where I'm at with time. So, you know, my wife, and look at her. She'll give me that little wave. <laughs> um, so if we talk about Joseph, Joseph went down as a slave sold by his brothers. You know, hope if y'all been to Bible study because, you know, if you get deep in the Bible, you can understand how these people are easily black. It's easy. So, you know, I think Pastor White, you're going to have hopefully a full crowd this, this coming Bible study. But um, when it comes to Joseph, it said that his brothers came, and he, they could not recognize him among the Egyptians. So I want y'all to give me a keyword. What, what month is this? Black history. So anytime I ask you, I want you to say the word black. Let's, let's practice. Okay. So what color were the Egyptians? Okay. So if Joseph was hiding among the Egyptians and even his own brothers could not recognize him, what color is Joseph? Okay. So if Joseph, let's go to the next slide. If Joseph is black, he had a full brother named Benjamin. What color is Benjamin? Okay, so you got parents, right? Uh, if you have a parent, one of them got to be black, one of them got to be a sister or something, right? So let's just say Rachel, right? Rachel is, right? So Rachel had a full-blooded sister named Leah. What color is Leah? She had six other tribes of Israel. What color are they? How many tribes? That's eight tribes, right, of black people. Then if, this is very easy, right? This is just logical sense. Um, when we actually talked about the two handmaids, because they were fighting over, you know, um, I don't know if y'all know the story about, you know, they were giving pomegranates when, for him to sleep with one wife and all that. And um, um, the slaves that usually among them are not their own people, right? So we know that Hagar um, with Abraham was an Egyptian. So a lot of these times the Hamites were their slaves. Ham means black, was African, right? So if these are slaves um, that from Ham, what color are they? Okay, so we got how many tribes there? That's one, two, three. That's 12 tribes. Wait a minute. All 12 tribes are what? All right. So very easy when we think logically about what the scripture says. So that's why it's important to understand and dig into your word and not just take a, a, a view, you know, like they taught. I mean, I'm just coming to this realization. I've been a minister for about 20 years, so, you know, <laughs> the last three years because a lot of the pictures that we've been given, you know, has been of, you know, Caucasians, right? So, you know, um, but when we actually look at the history, it's very interesting because even if, I didn't put it up here, but if, if you look at the line of the Messiah, you can see how a lot of the women, like, that they name, because there's only a couple of women that it names through Matthew 1 through the lineage, that a lot of them are Canaanites, and Canaanites come from Ham. So it makes, I maybe have to come bite me again, and I can kind of go through that, but I'm trying to save time. So if Rachel and Leah are black, and all the other ones at least are half black, right? We got another problem. Why? Let's go to the next slide. Jacob, Rachel, and Leah were cousins. So what color is Jacob? Mm. And then his parents, Isaac and Rebecca, was cousins. And Rebecca um, basically was the brother of Laban. And Laban was the father of, of Jacob or Israel's wife. So what color are they? Okay, black history. Right there in the Bible, right? And then you have pictures of what the Shemites look like. I can't go into all the details about them, but, you know, that the Shemites were actually, well, I think it's actually, yeah, I actually kept that one. Yeah, let's go to the next one. So this is actually a book that I got that actually talks about the um, archaeology of um, Israel and Jerusalem and other places. And this is actually is, um, this is actually was endorsed by the Israeli president of that time. So this is an official book. And these are the children of Shem. One of them is missing. But one thing that you quickly can see, there's something strange about the picture. Well, two things that's get easy to see. One, there's a brother up there, right? So how can these be connected cousins and brother nations? Huh? Second thing, you can see why is one hand-drawn and the others are pictures of archaeology? 
And if you flip over, you see another page, and it has the same picture, drawn picture. But it's easy to find the archaeology. And what color is the man there? He's black. And that's a bit, basically a picture of a Syrian. So when we talk about scripture, Jacob was called a Syrian. Oh, Laban, all of them were called Syrians. Hmm, and they are what color? Thank you. It's very interesting. We're also in Syria in the war, but I don't know if that's any related. But anyway, um, so let's go to the next slide. We're almost done. So if we have these two people who are married, right, they're called Israelites. Where are the black Israelites now? You ever thought about that? Where are they? Hmm. We never, you know, sometimes just thinking, taking a step back and understanding the scriptures, it'll become a little bit more relevant to our own personal lives. So, um, if we go to the next slide, you can actually see in Israel, the oldest people that's been in Israel right now um, are these people. They don't show you on TV who they are, but they said men in the middle, um, actually the ones on the right side, are called Afro-Palestinians because it's in the land of Palestine. That's where Israel is, Palestine. And um, the one on the left is actually a um, Beta Israel um, Jew, they call him. And America actually went and went to Sudan, I believe, and picked these people up in the plane because they said they were Israelites. And America also said they were Israelites and flew them to Israel. And that's where they're living now. And they're under the same oppression that we are as the people. So the people on the right, the one in the middle, um, the man, he actually takes people on tours. And he says, you can go look up the video on YouTube, and he says, that um, his people, his ancestors, were taken well, after um, they left, they fled um, Israel and went to Africa, and from Africa was taken as slaves to America. And he's living in Israel. They actually have deeds to the land, to the property. They own the land, even though you know some Israelis live there. Um, they own the land that actually you see on TV, but they don't care. They, you know, they can go to the courthouse and prove it, but they don't care. They do what they want to do with it. But it shows you that they actually are the oldest people living in the land for thousands of years are black Israelites. And they so claim it to us. They said that we're the same people as them, that we descend from the same heritage. So when we go to the next um, slide, um, this is my DNA. And it came from um, Ancestry, um, I think, what's that, 23 and Me, I think. And it's very odd because in the comment, it says that my ancient relatives were from northeastern Africa or the Arabian Peninsula. So if you see the little circle there, that's right there in the Middle East. I did not know any of my people came out of the Middle East. I'm thinking I'm looking in the jungles of West Africa, and here they are up in the Middle East. <laughs> now, they are so secular, so they say 60,000 years ago, of course, but we don't believe in that. So um, actually, if you, some of your Bibles are Zondervan Bibles. That's one of the world publishing um, Bibles. And actually, they came up with a Bible dictionary. And if you go right there to Lifeway at one of the stores, you can get this little Bible dictionary. And it says Ham, talking about Africa, right? Ham is Africa. It says the youngest son of Noah, born probably 96 years before the flood, and one of the eight persons to live through the flood, he became the progenitor or the you know, ancestor of the dark races, not the Negroes. Hey, Amen. I thought we came from Africa. I thought we descended from Ham. I thought, I don't know if any of y'all heard of the Hamite curse. Ham might curse saying that we were cursed because um, one of the sons, Canaan of, of, of Ham, looked on his father naked. Now all black people are cursed. They actually used it for slavery. And that's in my other lecture. But, yeah, it showed you. And even some Mormons go around still believing in it. And there's some black Mormons, and I don't know if they understand what they're believing in. But um, So if, they, if we didn't ascend from Ham, there was three sons that came off the boat. Ham, Sham, and Japheth. Ham is Africa. Japheth is Europe, and Sham is Asia. So sometimes I remember growing up, they used to call us the Afro-Asiatics, African and Asian, mix. So if we didn't come from Africa, that means we come from Sham. And Sham is the line of the Messiah, of the Israelite people. Very interesting. And this is where we get to my message here at the end. So we heard the scripture, actually, on the next slide, read about Deuteronomy 28. And this is when the people actually were entering into the land of um, Israel. And I um, actually believe they were on two mountains, um, Mount Gerizim and um, Nebo, I believe. 
And one they were pronouncing blessings, and the other they were pronouncing curses. And on the blessings it said, um, and if it shall come to pass, if, there's a condition word, right? If is a condition word. Doesn't mean it's automatic. Thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the, well, of Yah. Y'all know that's Yah now, right? In capital. Of Yah, where it really is Yahweh, Yahuwah, however you want to pronounce it, but I'm just going to say Yah for today. Um, of Yah thy God, to observe and to do all his, all his commandments. When I command thee this day, that Yah thy God will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth, right? And all the blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if, if, thou shalt hearken unto the voice of Yah thy God. And the uh, and Yah shall make thee the head, not the tail. Y'all heard that scripture. Head, not the tail, above, not beneath. You hear about the scripture, right? If that thou hearken unto the commandments of Yah, thy God, which I command thee this day to observe and do them, and thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day to the right hand or to the left to go after other gods to serve them. So that's a, the blessings, right? So let's talk about the curses, right? And that's this very long passage, so we can't read the whole thing. But when we go to the blessings of the next slide, in Deuteronomy 28, 15, it says, but, if, but it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of Yah thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command me this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. So these curses are going to continue to overtake you. And then it says in, down in 45 that, um, all these curses shall come upon thee and shall pursue thee and overtake it till thou be destroyed. Wow. Till thou be destroyed off the face of the earth? What? Because you did not hearken unto the voice of Yah thy God to keep his commandments which command thee, and they shall be unto you as a sign. So when you look at these curses, you will know who the people are based upon the signs of the curses, right? And for a wonder, and upon thy seed forever. Now, is eternal life forever? So when we say you have eternal life, that means forever, right? So when he says that this is going to happen forever until you turn away, what does that mean? Forever, right? Right? So let's go and talk about the curses, right? The next slide talks about what the curses look like, right? It says you'll be cursed in the city and the fields. You will be given illness until they remove from the land. So, you know, African Americans have the highest rate of sickness, you know, when it comes to high blood pressure, diabetes, and everything else. Um, you'll be sent as slaves across the world. Who you know has been sent as slaves across the world? You will have anxiety for your lives and depression not succeeding. Another man will sleep with your wives. What happened to the women that came across the Atlantic slave trade? They were raped, right? A lot of us got British in us too for a reason, right? Um, another, um, you will build buildings but cannot live in them. What happened to the White House? We built the White House, but well, th thankfully Obama helped us out, but before then, we didn't have anybody in the White House. Um, and you will farm but cannot partake of the harvest. Your children will be sold to captivity. The resources of your land will be used by another nation. Do you know how Africa is being treated and raped from these resources left and right right now? You'll be called a bywild word in all nations. You know the N-word? You know? Um, in all the other countries, they actually call people um, Cushy in Israel, which means the same thing, or Kappa. Um, so if you ever heard, one of my bosses actually made reference because I work at an international company and I had to go to HR about it. So you better understand what some of these other nations are calling us because they'll try to slide it in on you as well. Um, you, you, locusts shall eat your crop. If you look on the news, locusts are all over Africa right now. Um, you will be at the bottom. The others will lend you. So these other nations will rise up among you, these foreigners, and they will lend you while you will be at the bottom. I was also... Um, discriminated with a first home mortgage loan that we got a check didn't even know we were being discriminated against. I don't know if y'all heard about the black tax and stuff like that. It says iron yokes will be on your necks. How do they take the slaves out? An eagle is symbolized for the nation who will come against you. Enslaved by unknown nations with an unknown language who kills young and old. You ever heard about what happened in Florida with babies and how they use it as, as alligator bait? Remember people say you alligator bait? They're talking about the babies that they took and just lured the alligators to, to make belts and, and stuff like that. They actually had postcards. If you look at it, it's just amazing black history that we, you know, are, are basically not even knowing about. It said, men will be evil towards their brothers, wives, and children um, who they will leave. Look at the black families. So many black men leaving, right? Women will be evil towards their husbands, sons, and daughters. 
cannibalism would be among them. You know, in Africa, there's cannibalism, and people don't know about there's some history of slaves even were part of cannibalism, and you'll be taken away on ships. So who does these signs fit? All right, let's go down to the next one. Um, even the Messiah talks about this event. In Luke 21, it says that, and the disciples, talk, he was talking about the temple being destroyed. And the disciples asked him, it says, and they asked him, saying, Master, but when should all these things be? And what sign will there be when these things come to pass? And he said, and when ye see, shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is not. So in 70 AD, that happened. Actually, the Romans came. They burnt down the temple. You know how they kind of you see the Jewish people bring to that wall. That actually happened in 70 A.D. after the Messiah had been um, died or was resurre and resurrected and ascended to heaven. So he said, so that gives us a, a point right there of when this happened, when this occurred. Then down in 24, it says, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive in all nations. So we got a timeline now. After 70 A.D., after the temple was restored, when do we know? When all, when a, a certain people group were taken into all nations as slaves, only ones I know is us. Only ones I know is us. Um, and then it says Jerusalem shall be drawn, drawn down by Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be fulfilled. So that's a, another conversation. It's like you know we kind of think about you know who's living in Jerusalem at this time. But also there was a book written that talks about you know during the period from Pompey to Julius, it has been estimated that over one million Jews fled into Africa fleeing from Roman persecution and slavery. The slaves' markets were full of black Jewish slaves that went to Africa. All right, uh, got two more, and I'll be done. Um, and then, if we go to the next slide, it talks about some things about these people. So in Jeremiah 17, 4, it says, You shall discontinue from thine heritage that I gave thee. What's black people's heritage? What We don't know. We don't know other than African-American stuff, but we don't know what our heritage is. We don't know why we wear certain clothes, African clothes. We just wear them, right? Said that at the very beginning. But we do so because um, we want a connection back. We lost our heritage. We don't know who we are as a people. And it says that we will serve enemies in the land which thou knowest not. So we in the land that our people didn't know. You know they were not allowed to actually to um, write in their own language. See, a lot of people make you want to think that we were swinging off trees and didn't have, we're, we're not educated. But we did have a language. We just could not write in our own language. That was the issue. And if you know about anything about West Africa, you know, anybody know about King Masamusu? He's actually um, a king of Mali. He was the richest person ever on earth. Richer than Bill Gates, richer than Warren Buffett, any of those names, he's richer than all of them. And he actually built libraries. He built um, um, universities in West Africa before we went into slavery. So how could we be dumb people? How? When you start looking at all these inventions that African Americans make, it makes sense now, right? How are they so smart? How do they not get educated and can do surgery and, and um, create the refrigerator and the stoplight and all those things that they did because they were very knowledgeable, special people? And in Deuteronomy 4, it talks about how, you know, the Lord will scatter you among the nations. It says you will be all nations. So if you want to find who the Israelites are, you have to find people scattered around all nations. But it says, but, later on it says, but if, condition word again. From thence that thou shalt seek Yah thy God, thou shalt find him. If you seek him, that means you will find him, right? If thou seek him with all your heart and with all your soul, when thou art in tribulations, in a time of, 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 of trouble, and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days. What's the latter days? The last days. So wait a minute, how was Abraham way back in Deuteronomy talking about these things that would happen in the latter days? And it says, and if thou turn to Yah thy God and shalt be obedient to his voice, for Yah is a merciful God, he will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of the fathers which he swear unto them. So he said, even though we are hard-headed, stiff-necked people, that he has sworn a covenant with Abraham that this nation of people are a great people, that he will actually reclaim back to himself in the latter days, that he will never forget you, he'll never depart. So it makes sense how those slaves were getting whipped and beat, and they were trying to, trying to eliminate them, and they still kept on growing and growing and growing, just like in Egypt when Pharaoh tried to kill the babies, they kept on growing and growing and growing. We are very special people. 
There's a reason why they can't be, we can't not be destroyed. And it's not just a covenant with us. We're supposed to be an example, a model for the nations. And there's other people that's also part of this covenant. That's not us. That they can also be pulled into if they basically do the same thing. For we know that the Messiah is an Israelite, right? And if we cleave unto him, that we can actually receive the salvation that he has given. So it's first and foremost, we need to make sure that, you know, we're not hating other people, especially if they understand. How, but the thing about it, when I went to seminary at Southeastern, we talked about how can you be a, 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 a minister, a scholar, and then have hatred? How can you wake up on Sunday morning and preach and then beat slaves? So there is a connection unto what you're doing, you know, even if you're not an Israelite or even if you are an Israelite. Because still it says that with your whole heart. So there's a salvation. It's just not being the people. It's, a, it's actually because we are the people, we have to make sure that we have draw close to him and live a life that's holy and acceptable before him. And the last slide, it goes back to what we actually talked about earlier, the scripture that was given. And it says, and it shall come to pass. That means a future. It shall come to pass. When all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and curses, which I have set before thee, and thou shalt call them to mind among all the nations, whether the, where Yah thy God have driven thee. So this is a time they are, people are in those nations as captives, right? And shall return unto Yah thy God, and shall obey his voice according to all the command I command thee this day, thou and thou children. That's so why it's so important that we make sure that our children go to Bible study, that they're involved in church, that they sing and give glory unto him. You know, and many times people will take people, their children to a rated R movie, but they won't even take them to church. Have mercy on us. Right? We don't even sit, we'll sit down there and have a, a discussion about everything else, but when it comes down to the Bible, where's the discussion? You know, do we tell our children to keep the commandments? Do they even know the commandments? Do we even know the commandments? Do we even know the Ten Commandments? But this is a life, life or death situations, blessings and curses. But yet we don't take it seriously. Then we wonder why our nation is so messed up like the way it is, why are people are always suffering and going through situations. When it's so easy, the only thing we have to do is give a glory to him, to give our life to him. And it's one thing just to say, oh, yeah, I'm, I forgive me. Forgive me, God, for all the wrong, being in the club, doing smoking and um, cheating on my wife. That's one thing. But there's also a re thing called repentance. you got to repent. And when you repent, what do you repent from? Your sins. And what sins, how do you know what you're sinning based upon the commandments? So we can't just reject the commandments and they, when they show us what will give us life. So that's why it's so important that we actually understand the word, make sure that we do things that glorify him and not the things of the world, to come to our own understandings and do the things that we want to do, just like Adam and Eve did, that failed and left the garden. So that's the reason why he had to send a Messiah to come and die for us so we can be once again united with him for all people. But the Israelites were the ones that were supposed to be assigned to the world. And a lot of rabbis are going around, Jewish rabbis from Israel, are going around to African Americans and saying, don't you know you're an Israelite? Jewish rabbis are going to hear Americans saying that. Sounds like there's awakening going on, right? Sounds like it says, and it shall come to pass that you will wake up to these things. These things will come to mind of who you are. And it's amazing, not only in America, but all around the world, that people of the same tribe, West Africa, are waking up to this. This is not something that's strange, because people in Africa, in the Caribbean, in South in Brazil are saying the same things. And it's just, like, amazing that a lot of people are waking up to it. But there's a danger of the awakening as well. There are some groups that's actually taking advantage of that. They start speaking hate and those type of things, but what they won't show you in the news are there's people like the group here that comes that know who they are, but yet still wants you to show you that they're grandparents and parents and things of that nature, and they still love the Messiah just like everybody else does. They're not crazy. They just want to hunger for his word and understand who they are. So they want to even come here just to show you that, that, hey, we all know them, and there's nothing wrong with understanding your history. But see, a lot of stuff in the media is trying to push that away, but the scripture keeps on saying, I'm getting off track, sorry. Um, I'm going to start preaching to you. <laughs> uh, and it's about over, so I don't want to delay your time. But then it says um, in um, verse 3, Then thou, then that then, Yah, thy God, will turn thy captivity. So that means you have to be in the place of captivity. Are we still in the land of our captivity? All right? 
and have compassion upon thee, and will return and gather thee from all the nations where Yah thy God has gathered thee. And if all if if any of thine be driven out unto the utmost parts of heaven, from thence will Yah thy God gather thee, and from thence will he fetch thee. And Yah thy God will bring thee into the land which thy fathers possess, and thou shalt possess it, and he will do good will do thee good, and multiply thee above thy fathers. And Yah thy God will circumcise thine heart. You heard about circumcising your heart before? And the heart of your seed, your children, to the love Yah thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, that thou mayest live, livest. So, as we wrap up today, I want you to just think about your life. Where is, where is your life right now? You know, are you standing in the line of the things that he wants us to do, or are you falling outside of that, where those blessings and curses? We have to come together as a nation, but the only way you can come together is if each individual first look at their own life and first repent and come to him. And that's what a nation is. It's a nation of people. So are we ready to just go forth? I want you to take time to really don't just receive what I said here today. Go look it up. Go look it up. Like I said, I got a three-hour lecture. <laughs> I can come four hour. I can come break it down. But in the same sense, this is stuff that's not even hidden. You can just Google it and look it up. You know, so take the time to really understand who your heritage is, your biblical heritage, because it makes a difference. It's actually a prophecy part of the world, the right where we live in. That world is awakening, showing that we're actually entering into the last days. I always tell people, revelation has to happen one day. You can put your head under the pillow, but he's going to crack open that sky, and you better be ready. Hallelujah. You better make sure your line lines up with him. And it's not a curse to do so. It's a blessing. It's a reward. Like I, told, I, I, just, like, I don't know if I said it earlier, but you know, I was just going through a time in my job. I put in my notice, had a, got a new job, and they let me go early on purpose. On purpose. But he provided somebody for me. He gave me. People came together without me even asking and helped me out for bills and then got money from other places. But he still took care of me. You know, I was just telling him how he would set a table before you in the presence of your enemies. He would anoint your head with oil. Your, your cup will run over. But you got to know who you are and why you are special people. You are very special people. And that's why it's so much hidden from you. And as we stand, I want you to just think about your life right now. Think about where you are and where we need to be. It doesn't matter if you're young or old, if you're rich or poor doesn't matter if you understand anything I say other than you understand that the Messiah died for your sins. It has to be through the Messiah. A lot of people don't believe in the Messiah, even in this awakening, but that's where our power lies. That's our strength. So I ask you just to think about that. Okay. I want to make sure I was in, in line. Um, think about your life. If there's anybody here that wants to give their life fully unto him, that where their heart is circumcised and their life is changed, when they're ready to go forth in the things, the blessings that he's already have in store for you, I ask you to come here today. And as we think about those things, it said, you know, don't put your hand to the plow and look back. To make sure you go forward in the things that he has given us. And just like those slaves that was out there in the field, think about your life. And as we wait for you, let us just sing that, that song, that Negro spiritual kumbaya. Is that all right? Kumbaya, my Lord. Kumbaya. Kumbaya, my Lord. Is there one? <laughs>